На этих выходных в Эстонию прибыл эскадренный миноносец типа Арлеберг USS Paul Ignatius. Это уже пятый корабль ВМС США, прибывший в Эстонию с начала мая 2022 года. Достигая в длине более 160 метров и будучи введенным в эксплуатацию всего лишь три года назад, это военное судно занимает видное место в военно-морском флоте США. Сегодня мы поднимемся на его палубу, дабы рассмотреть его поближе, а также поговорим с людьми, благодаря которым это судно из металла и стали может эффективно функционировать и выполнять свои задачи. We came to Tallinn as part of a routine port visit during our operations in the Baltic. So welcome to USS Paul Ignatius. This is guided missile destroyer 117. It's one of the newest DDGs. Uh, that's the acronym for guided missile destroyer in the United States Navy. Uh, we were commissioned in 2019, so just a few years ago. Uh, quick facts, the ship is about 510 feet long. It's about 66 feet wide and it has about 100,000 horsepower uh, and goes about 30 knots. Uh, one knot, 1.25 miles per hour. Not sure in kilometers per hour what that is, um, but those are quick basic facts. Uh, the ship weighs 9,200 tons as well. Um, without further ado though, we'll head to the aft missile deck and continue the, with the tour. My job entails is anti-submarine warfare. So over here we have the torpedo tubes. We can launch up to six torpedoes before we have to reload. That's for a short range weapon. We have a sonar system up forward. We have a large array, we can go active. Uh, so we can send a transmission out, sound through the water and come back and we can get information off of whatever's under the surface. We have helicopters uh, that we keep back here in the hangars, and we can deploy sonar buoys off of there, um, and we can deploy those further out, out of our range of sonar, and pick up contacts that way. We also have an array that we can stream that can pick up contacts a lot deeper than what we would pick up on the hull array. And we have a torpedo countermeasure back aft that deters the tor any enemy torpedoes coming at us. And it'll hit that before it comes out from the ship. Sea ram. And you see once you move up forward, we have Sea Wiz and Sea ram. Our Sea ram has a, a missile launcher pack. And what it does, it defends us against incoming hostile missiles. It shoots a smaller missile to uh, shoot down the larger missile or any uh, low-flying aircraft. It is completely uh, independent and does the thing for everything else. Then last, but certainly not least, we have our aft PLS missile launcher. So this is a modular system. It employs a multitude of different missiles. Um, and from air defense to ship defense, and then from strike warfare to anti-submarine warfare. Whichever missiles you want to use, we load them in here and they pop out and launch. Right here, if you look over there, we have something called a refueling station. So one of the things that blue ocean navies do is they will refuel at sea so that we do not have to pull into port. Uh, the US Navy a couple years ago in 2020 set a record we were able to have a ship at sea for 214 days without pulling into a single port at the height of COVID because they're able to refuel right there at a station like that. Um, we'll walk back here so you can get a view of our flight deck to see where we do our helicopter operations. As we're walking back, you'll hear and see this structure right here. This is one of our three gas turbine generators. So this is what is currently providing electricity power for the ship. All the equipment uh, that we have powered on right now is able to be turned on because of these generators. Uh, each generator is large enough that it could power a small neighborhood independently on its own. Um, and like I said, we have three of those on board the ship. All right. So as we come back here, you'll be able to get a look on the flight deck right here. We're currently setting up 
for a reception later this evening with dignitaries here in Estonia. Uh, but this is where all of our helicopter operations are conducted. So as they mentioned, uh, we have two helicopters that we carry on board the ship. They're underneath of our feet right now, one of them. We've got one in a port hangar, one in a starboard. Uh, they're known as MH-60 Romeos. Uh, so if you've ever seen Black Hawk Down or one of these Hollywood movies, um, and MH-60 is basically the naval variant of a Black Hawk helicopter uh, that the U.S. Army flies. Uh, the reason I bring the Black Hawk up is more people are usually familiar with that. Um, the Romeo is a little bit smaller and the tail folds in so that it's able to fit on a ship. Uh, so that's the flight deck. Uh, one of the things that having helicopters on this ship lets us do is integrate into our anti-submarine warfare mission. Uh, so we're one of, we're only the second guided missile destroyer that has been forward deployed by the United States here to the European theater to have helicopters embarked on board. And that brings a host of capability that we're able to work with our NATO allies, integrating our Romeos and our ASW mission together, whether we're working uh, here in the Baltic, in the Mediterranean, or in the Atlantic. This is what's known as our RAST track. So RAST stands for Recovery, Assist, Secure, Traverse. Uh, so there is a, we call it a sled. Um, so it's a, basically a piece of equipment that will slide in and out on that track. And what it does is in bad weather, it will actually, it has a, uh, a cable that goes up and it will hook into the bottom of the helicopter. And in bad weather, bad seas, it helps pull the helicopter down to the flight deck and secure it. Uh, one of the things that is unique about aviation operations on a ship, vice on land, is that on a ship you are rolling back and forth and pitching up and down, making it a lot more challenging for a pilot to land on something that's continuously moving. So that system is designed to assist pilots in bringing their uh, helicopter onto the flight deck safely. One of the things we're gonna pass here, uh, these slats that you see, these are the intakes for our gas turbine mains. Uh, we call them GTMs. They're the engines that power the ship through the water. Uh, so we have four gas turbine mains on board USS Paul Ignatius. Each one is approximately 25,000 horsepower for a total of 100,000 horsepower on the ship. Um, they're basically the sort of engine that you would see on a Boeing 737, 747, an Airbus, uh, but they're built specifically for a ship, uh, but it's the same premise as far as how the gas turbine engine works. Please watch your step as you come up here. How's it going, sir? Gentlemen. So we're now at the front part of the ship, which in the Navy we, we refer to as the forecastle or the forecastle. About the gun, it's got 310 inches on the barrel. Um, her name is Brandy. She's a very rough and tough fighter. We're called the Ship Shakers for a reason. I'm here to talk about the Mark 15 Phalanx Seawiz system. It's a, our ship's last line of defense. It shoots 4,500 rounds a minute. My job here as a bosun man on board is all topside work. That includes topside preservation of rust from the seawater, um, topside evolutions, air evolutions, and lowering and hoisting our small boats for whatever that might be, man overboard, um, multiple different things. So I'm gonna talk about our ship's anchor today a little bit, and then that blue nose up there, we just earned the Arctic Circle. So our ship's anchor is a standard Navy stockless anchor, 9,000 pounds, and then down below, downstairs, we have 1,000 feet of anchor chain. Um, this is the U.S. Navy's second guided missile destroyer with a single centerline anchor after the Thomas Hudner. So unlike traditional guided missile destroyers who would have a port and starboard anchor, Paul Ignatius only utilizes the centerline anchor. So here you'll see Paul Ignatius' blue nose. This is a U.S. Navy tradition that 
paint this front circle of the ship, otherwise known as the bull nose. We'll paint it blue once we've crossed into the Arctic Circle, which we re recently have done um, while supporting NATO operations. So in addition to anchoring evolutions, as I said earlier, most of mates on board do a lot of different stuff. We're not really the type of people to sit and work on computers. Most of our work is done with our hands. So in addition to anchoring, we'll do small boat operations, underway replenishments where we'll re receive cargo and fuel underway. We'll also do small boat operations, and then last but not least, flight operations. Right now we're holding two SH Romeo helicopters in our port and starboard hangar bay that's utilized for anti-submarine warfare and search and rescue operations. So my job on the flight today is called the landing signalman enlisted. While doing so, you'll see me do some signals like this, landing our helicopter, and then tying it up so it's secured safely on the deck. When we're out to sea, we need gas and we need food, right? Otherwise we'll run out and we can't stay out to sea as long. So the U.S. Navy, a couple years ago, started what's called the underway replenishment. Stream UNREP, standard attention underway replenishment method. So we'll come alongside a USNS or a UK oiler and pump gas and receive cargo, food, mail, anything that we need to get while we're underway to continue our operations. If you look behind me, we see this blue flag with white stars on it. So this flag is known as the Union Jack. So a few years ago, the United States Navy was flying a different flag. It was a flag with a snake and red and white stripes that below it said, don't tread on me. That flag's known as the Navy Jack. Uh, the Navy Jack was erected and put up on our ships after September 11th, 2001. And the United States Navy historically flies that flag during times of war. This flag, the Union Jack is flown during times of peace. So a few years ago, the United States of America declared an end to the global war on terrorism. And over the last few years, we have shifted to a peacetime global competition of uh, peer competitors and great power competition. So we're going to move into the skin of the ship, what we call the interior, uh, and show you the mess decks where the sailors eat and spend some of their free time. We're about to enter the interior of Paul Ignatius. So U.S. guided missile destroyers are fit out with something called CPS, Collective Protection System. Uh, what that is, is the inside of the ship is pressurized greater than the outside. Uh, so as we go in, we'll go in individually, a uh, few at a time, and one door will open, the other door will stay closed. We close this door, go in to the next one. Uh, otherwise, oldest air throws the door open. Um, and the reason that we do this is so that in the event of some sort of uh, chemical or biological attack or uh, anything like that, those agents are pushed out of the ship so they're not able to go into the air ducts and end up infecting sailors inside the ship. So we could take probably two to three people with him in there first, maybe just the first one. Uh, one of the things you'll see right off the bat uh, in the U.S. Navy is we have watertight doors we have watertight hatches right here. Uh, and then in the middle of that, that circular thing is what's called a watertight scuttle. Uh, we'll head down now. So as we're walking, uh, you're getting a glimpse of what we call the passageways that our sailors will transit through uh, day in and day out. Uh, this one is probably the longest one, one of the longest ones on the ship. So here, uh, we're now uh, in the area that we call the mess decks. So this is where the crew of USS Paul Ignatius takes its meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we have about two, uh, 300 sailors on board the ship. So over the course of about an hour for each meal, they'll cycle through here and, and take their meals. Uh, the other thing that you see as we look at this back wall here is this is our namesake, Paul Ignatius, uh, the gentleman that the ship is named after. So Paul Ignatius, uh, he served as a naval officer in World War II on USS Manila Bay. Uh, our motto on this ship is always ready, fight on. Always ready is taken from USS Manila Bay, his ship during World War II. Uh, following the war, uh, he would go on to attend Harvard uh, and he would get a master's at 
Harvard in uh, the Northeast United States. And then he would go on to work for uh, the Department of Defense as undersecretary uh, in the Department of Defense overall, the Army, and then eventually he would become the Secretary of the Navy for a few years in the 1960s. Uh, so you, we have a photo here of him in Vietnam witnessing a demonstration on a river patrol boat, um, him with Admiral uh, Zumwalt in Vietnam uh, talking to some soldiers. And then after his time as the Secretary of the Navy, he would go on and serve as the president of the Washington Post, which is one of the uh, largest, most well-known United States newspapers. Um, Paul Ignatius is in fact still alive. Uh, so, 1920, he was born, I believe he was born in 1920. Um, so this year, I believe it was his 102nd birthday that he celebrated. Normally our ship will put together a video uh, and send it to him uh, as a sort of birthday greeting message every year. The last thing I will want to mention though is if you look here at our drink uh, dispensers, one thing that you will not see uh, is soda. So the US Navy uh, a few years back while uh, under the Obama administration uh, launched a uh, initiative to, pr to promote health and wellness in the United States. And one of the things that we have done in the Navy to help promote that is we no longer serve uh, sugary carbonated beverages here on the mess line. Um, so you've got juice, milk, water, uh, and then coffee. Coffee is the fuel that makes the Navy run. I'm Chief Cryptologic Technician. Uh, I've been in the Navy 16 years, originally from Chicago, Illinois. I am the uh, Chief Electronic Warfare Technician on board. Uh, so what that means in layman's terms is uh, primarily uh, the sailors that work for me run uh, signals analysis and radar evaluation uh, using two of the antennas that you'll see up here on the uh, port and starboard side. And then in addition to that, we also control the majority of uh, the ship's countermeasures. So those are on this deck uh, behind me. So we've got uh, chaff launchers over here. These are the traditional, conventional, older type chaff. Uh, so a uh, countermeasure that goes off and throws tin foily type material into the atmosphere. Uh, then we have our uh, active side over here, as well as our uh, new launchers over here that are uh, uh, put out a uh, countermeasure that's uh, essentially a giant inflatable. So what are countermeasures is the question that we always get. So in the event that uh, there's a missile engagement inbound on the ship, it is our job to create a false radar return for that missile seeker uh, to go after rather than coming after the ship. So that is the purpose of these countermeasures. And as I said before, that's the job of myself and the sailors that work for me. Uh, and we operate down in the uh, Combat Information Center, which I think you guys have already toured. This is my gun. Um, it shoots 25 millimeters and it also shoots uh, 7.56 7, uh, millimeters. This one is about this big. This one's about this big. This is my EOS. I'm allowed to shoot shoot in the nighttime. Um, I can see in the dark, so it has um, night qualities. And as well as surface targets, I can shoot um, air targets as well. Now I can shoot air targets as well. Uh, a gun, you can shoot from here or you can shoot from the pilot house. We shoot from the pilot house that has joysticks. Really simple. And in, anytime you shoot from here, turn this on, arm the gun, um, make sure that's down and then shoot, that's it. This one holds 160 rounds, and this holds 720 rounds. Simple, that's it. Uh, quick. So my ammunition goes through here, comes up here, and it goes in the gun. Every time it shoots, this goes forward, and it turns right here, misfire, press this, it goes back again. Then I shoot again, then I shoot again, so you shoot again. This one is more simple, not really much to it. Um, this just rotates when I shoot, that's all. Then the ammo goes in here. And that's it. I'm quartermaster. Um, I work up here in the bridge. Um, we use these systems to navigate over here. Um, it's not really 
energized right now. These are the systems we use to navigate over the water. Um, and we have our, our helms over here that we use to drive the ship with right here. If you want to get a good view. We'll have a person stationed right here and this is how we drive the ship. And uh, yeah, we're in charge of keeping all the navigation and everything that goes with that. All right, so as QM3 uh, told you, this is called the bridge or the pilot house. Uh, in addition to what he talked about, I also want to talk about uh, what do I do as an officer up here or uh, Mr. Hallis is an officer up here on the bridge of a United States warship. Um, so a junior officer in the U.S. Navy uh, will start their time right up here as the conning officer. So the conning officer will stand here uh, and they'll look out the front window and they'll, uh, this is called a centerline Polaris. It shows true bearings uh, and they will be able to navigate the ship looking at when we're out at sea, other ships uh, being able to say, okay, this vessel is at 045 degrees true. Uh, and that correlates then with the radar, hopefully, that what we have a junior officer of the deck operating. So that's another junior officer, and they will be working in tandem with the conning officer to make sure that we are navigating safely through waters. Uh, the conning officer will also issue commands to, uh, as QM3 discussed, our helmsman and lee helmsman who will stand back here and they will execute those orders turning the rudder of the ship uh, to the right or left at a specific angle depending on how quickly we would like to turn and they will also change the engines uh, which changes our speed up here uh, we have the system that we use to navigate the conning officer is able to look at what heading the ship is on so we're at 172 essentially true um, the shafts, uh, the propellers are not spinning right now and we're not moving. Uh, but that is, allows the conning officer to see where we're going, how fast we're going. Uh, we can see the relative wind uh, that's coming to the ship. And then the last officer position that we have up here is known as the officer of the deck. So the officer of the deck is the captain's direct representative for safety of navigation while we are underway. Uh, the captain of the ship cannot be up here 24 seven as we're underway. And so as a result, the officer of the deck is his or her direct representative executing his or her orders. And one of the things that's very unique about that position here in the US Navy is that normally that person is 23, 24, 25 years old. So I myself was 23 years old when I was qualified as an officer of the deck underway. And I had a uh, quartermaster chief actually asked me when that event occurred, he said, sir, how many people are you responsible for right now? And I thought he meant how many people are up here on the bridge, the boats made of the watch, our lookouts, our quartermaster. So I answered him with a low number and he said, no, sir, that's not correct. You're responsible right now for 330 people uh, because if the officer of the deck makes a bad decision, miscalculates, the ship can end up running aground having a collision and having an event that potentially results in a loss of life or damage to the ship. So the U.S. Navy puts a lot of responsibility in our officers of the deck uh, and it's probably a position that's very unique without an equivalent in any other of the military branches in the United States military right now. My belief is uh, anytime we can take a U.S. warship into the Baltic and come to the uh, Eastern Front, as we call it for NATO, uh, is a time that we are able to both work with our allies and uh, help to ensure the safety and security. And so I would hope that many more ships come to uh, Tallinn. We've had an enjoyable time here so far.